All right, so uh, moving along now in Rudolf Steiner's Outline of Esoteric Science, um, this video will cover pages 330 to 352, or if you have a different edition, that's paragraphs 36 through 48, in which uh, Steiner discusses uh, the upper two faculties of inspiration and intuition. Um, so, so far he's discussed uh, imagination. Um, so we have... Uh, and I wish that he had chosen different words because the words imagination, inspiration, and intuition are being used here in a totally different way from their banal, uh, since perceptible, common, daily usage. Um, it's better to say imaginative cognition, cognition by inspiration, and then intuitive cognition, which, which he does use. Uh, so it's, it's better to understand it that way. These are different types of co spiritual cognition. And so we have seen that with imaginative cognition, we have transformed the astral body um, by means of imaginative contemplation into the spirit self or the manas. And this is done through uh, detaching the senses from the physical world by meditating on an image such as the rose cross, the black cross with the roses appearing in the center of it in a circle. And um, so what we'll see happening here is, so we've got the transformation of the astral body and in that astral body, uh, the awakening of the chakras, he calls them lotus flowers, but he's definitely talking about the chakras as this first paragraph makes clear here. Um, astral body transformed into the spirit self with imaginative cognition. Cognition by inspiration then will transform the etheric body into the life spirit or the buddhi. The spirit self is the manas, the life spirit is the buddhi. And finally, uh, intuitive cognition will transform the physical body. Uh, into the spirit body, or what uh, Steiner calls the Atma. Uh, those Sanskrit terms are useful because you can anchor them if you get different translations. Um, even though he has taken them from Sanskrit, they're used in a totally different way in Sanskrit. Uh, the Manamaya Kosha and Vedanta has to do with the intellect, not with the life spirit, not with the spirit self. Um, but it's good to just have them as anchors. So we saw that uh, with imaginative uh, contemplation, we're trying to gradually, and this is a process of gradually divorcing the senses from their tie to the physical world. You do this through imagining, let's say, this black cross with the roses around it, or it can be any image, uh, but he says symbolic images work better. But now he points out, he says, um, the elements of this image have, even though they've been combined to create a, a, a fantastic image or an image that is not found in daily experience, uh, nonetheless, it is made up of elements that have still been drawn from the sense perceptible world, such as the black of the cross or the roses themselves. They are still tied, even though it's in imagination, they are still tied, the images, to the physical world. Even if you're meditating on a plant, let's say, on the processes of the, a seed transforming into a plant, it's still tied to the physical world. So now with cognition by inspiration, we want to move up and dissolve the image altogether so that there are no images now with uh, cognition by inspiration. And we want to turn inward and look into uh, our souls and meditate on the processes within our souls that have produced that image. Um, and this is a process of turning inward. Um, and it's a little bit like, it, it's very much analogous to yoga. Uh, the processes that he's talking about here, whereby the yogic initiate begins by meditating on uh, uh, an image of, let's say, a clay image of a god. Um, that's a sense perceptible image. Uh, the, uh, the yogic initiate meditates on that, then uh, dispenses with the physical image, and then in yogic posture and with imagination, reconstructs the image of the god. This corresponds to Steiner's imaginative cognition, uh, reconstructing the image of the god. And then gradually the image of the god is dissolved so that there is attained a oneness then with the god. And this is the, the, the samadhi, the union of Atman with Brahman. The Atman is absorbed into the Brahman. And... Uh, as we'll see Steiner's processes of moving from imagination to inspiration to intuition uh, and intuitive cognition, uh, one does indeed achieve oneness with spiritual beings. Whereas in cognition by inspiration, uh, we are able to perceive now the relations between spiritual beings. Uh, cognition by inspiration has to do with perceiving connections, with perceiving larger spiritual, supersensible contexts that give us 
a means for perceiving uh, what Steiner says is reading the hidden script or reading the Akashic record, uh, perceiving the hidden inward relationships between these spiritual beings. So we're moving up beyond the realm of images into the realm of spirit, uh, and it's getting more and more refined as we move up the ladder from imagination, imaginative cognition to a cognition by inspiration. And also, as we saw, this affects the, the bodies, uh, the subtle bodies, as we saw with uh, imaginative cognition, we had chakras awakening in the astral body. Now with cognition by inspiration, uh, the etheric body, uh, certain currents and meridians are awakened in the etheric body. And he says that what happens is that there's the creation of a central organ in the area of the heart, which would correspond to the fourth chakra, the anahata uh, chakra, in that area, a, an organ is created that sends out meridian lines, lines, he doesn't use the word meridian, but he says it sends out lines and configurations that connect all the chakras together and actually extends outward into physical external space. And he says that this process has to be done gradually and it has to move downward. It, it's curious that he's clearly familiar with Kundalini Yoga here and he's borrowed uh, uh, ideas from uh, Indian metaphysics, but whereas Kundalini Yoga begins from the bottom, literally, uh, and, and moves upward to the Sahasrara Chakra, which is the crown of the head, the thousand petaled lotus, which indicates the attainment of Samadhi, the uh, union of the Atman with the Brahman. It's interesting that Steiner's movement goes downward. He says to, to create this organ in the etheric body through cognition by inspiration, uh, the move, a certain center must begin first with the head, although I noticed that in this first paragraph here, he skips the Sahasra chakra. He doesn't mention it. He says, um, uh, here he's talking about imaginative uh, imagination awakening the chakras, and, he, and the chakras that he mentions, he says, of these soul organs, we may mention the following, the so-called two-petaled lotus flower that we feel as if between the eyebrows. That's the Agya chakra that perceives uh, the realm of the gods. Uh, the 16 petaled lotus flower in the area of the larynx, that's the Vishuddha chakra that has to do with ascetic self control and purification. The 12 petaled lotus flower in the area of the heart, that's the, what's the fourth chakra that has to do with compassion and love for others. Um, and then, um, then he says, other such organs appear in the vicinity of other parts of the physical body. He refuses to mention the chakra of the genitals, the Zvadhisthana chakra and the chakra of the Muladhara, which is between, which is the perineum between uh, the anus and the genitals. He refuses to mention them. <laughs> that might just be a, a, a Victorian sensibility still hanging around, uh, but Steiner's always bashful when it comes to anything having to do with sex. He, he, he skips over it. Um, but the point is, so regarding cognition by inspiration, he says um, it has to begin, there's a center that begins in the head and it moves down into the larynx and then it moves to this heart region in the etheric body where this new organ is created. And it has to be a slow, gradual process because he says in abnormal spiritual development, this, the, the, the organ will just suddenly be created in the heart area of the etheric body, and that will lead to visionary seizures. That, that will lead to fanatics, uh, spiritual fanatics. It'll be an abnormal development. That, that's when you get the phenomenon of, of the spiritual zealot or the fanatic. It has to be a gradual process of meditation uh, through cognition by inspiration, meditating on the relations between spiritual beings, on the processes within you that produced the images of imagination, um, and so it's cognition by inspiration. And so there's a gradual um, etherealization process. We're moving, we're yet another step removed from the sense perceptible world. Now we're not even dealing with images. We're in the world of the spirits. We're in the super sensible plane and we're perceiving the hidden inward relations, reading the hidden script of that plane as he puts it. That's cognition by inspiration. So then the final uh, faculty of the spirit that is developed is what he calls intuition or intuitive cognition, which is better because he's not, by intuition, the German word is probably Anschauung. Uh, he does not mean anything to do with perception of anything in the outer world, intuiting possibilities in the Jungian sense or anything like that. 
Uh, this is why I wish he had chosen three different words or made up three words because uh, these words have totally different meanings. So intuitive cognition now, we're moving up all the way to the top. We are transforming the physical body now through intuitive cognition into the Atma, which is the spirit body. Uh, so we move up from uh, Manas to Bodhi to Atma, from spirit self to life spirit to spirit body. And now he says, uh, he's actually kind of vague about intuitive cognition. You know, all he says is that now we move from uh, in imaginative cognition, perceiving images with the mind's eye, to in cognitive inspiration or inspiration by cognition to perceiving the relationships between spiritual beings. Now we attain oneness with the beings themselves. We attain us just as in Indian yoga, uh, where the ultimate goal of contemplating the deity is to dispense with the deity altogether and achieve samadhi, oneness. Same thing here with Steiner. This is why I'm convinced that He's taken his model from Indian models, from Indian prototypes, from yoga, uh, in which now there's a fusion with the spiritual beings. And if there's a fusion with these spiritual beings, now you are able to see into your past lives. You are able to see into another person's past lives, because in a certain sense, it's kind of fusion with them that's going on. So you can't get to the level of being able to perceive past lives the way Steiner was able to do, and he gave a magnum opus, absolute demonstration of this in his last great lecture cycle in 1924, Karmic Relationships, which exists in eight volumes, where he reads the past lives of a whole bunch of famous uh, European individuals, many of them now obscure, but Nietzsche is in there, and Marx and Engels, and their comical past lives, and so forth. So he's able to read into their past lives uh, because he has attained this uh, intuitive cognition. So these are the upper faculties of the spirit uh, that has taken the, the, the bodies, the physical body, the etheric body, and the astral body, and transubstantiated them into the manastabuddhi and the atma, the spirit self, the life spirit, and the spirit body. So this is the process of transformation. This is Steiner's yoga. Um, and he says that the effects of all of this will improve you as a person. You will be able to empathize with others better. Uh, you will not be so quick to judge others uh, for their faults, but you won't ignore their faults either. He says the soul always needs to be in, in balance. Uh, you may see a shortcoming in an individual uh, and that you previously respected. You had all this respect for and you see a shortcoming in them and now suddenly you no longer have respect for them. That's going to too far an extreme. Steiner says, uh, that shortcoming you should be able to have compassion for and see that maybe there's a reason for it being there. Maybe the great qualities in that person have caused those shortcomings to appear and that they're tied in together. So you always want to achieve a balance between um, judgment, judging others' faults on the one hand, and just simply tossing them out uh, and having complete compassion to such a degree, rather, having complete compassion to such a degree that you overlook their faults. There needs to be a balance somewhere in between. And cultivating these upper faculties will help um, make you a, a wiser and better and more evolved and advanced person. And so um, there is th these aren't just concepts. This is Steiner... Uh, this is concrete now. This is These practices take a long time to develop, and he says that they require a lot of patience, a lot of persistence, and it has to be a movement into these upper regions in a very slow, disciplined way. You start by meditating on that pencil and focusing on it for five minutes. Whatever the object happens to be, you just randomly take, let's say this pen, I focus on it for five minutes so that I train my thinking uh, to be able to focus before I move inward and start constructing uh, whatever mythical image I want to construct, whether it's a Hindu deity or a rose cross meditation, and then move from that toward a contemplation on the forces within my soul that has produced that image and the relations between spiritual beings in the astral world, and then finally to a fusion with those beings so that I can perceive their inner nature. So we move from images to interpretation of contexts, to identity, to a fusion in which there is no longer a subject-object distinction. Same thing in Indian yoga. The goal is ultimately to dissolve the subject-object distinction. In waking consciousness, I as a subject am distinct from all of these objects out here. Um, in meditation, uh, I can imagine a god, but I'm still, even though it's I've 
removed myself from the sense perceptible world and am imagining the God piecing him or her together. There's still a subject object distinction that needs to ultimately be dissolved to attain oneness or samadhi, uh, moksha, liberation, uh, and the fusion and union of Atman with Brahman. Steiner's process is, is very similar here, uh, but it is significant that he omits the top chakra in his discussion, the Sahasrara. He's not interested in dissolving, uh, and we aren't interested in the West, in dissolving ourselves, our identities, our personal, individual egos into the formless nothingness of Brahman. Um, that's not what we're trying to do in the West. So I think it's very significant that uh, Steiner takes over the chakras, but he omits the Sahasrara chakra that would dissolve your identity as an individual into the formless nothingness of Brahman, which is just pure Satchitananda, being consciousness bliss energy. And there are no other predicates. Actually, there are, even those are predicates, Satchitananda, even those are predicates that should not be ascribed to Brahman because Brahman is that which is beyond all conceptual uh, formations. It's, it's the ultimate mystery. But that's not what Steiner's after here. Uh, Steiner is after us following uh, super sensible wisdom, spiritual science, in order to make better people out of us so that we can function better in society, not leave it and go out to the forest and meditate uh, like a yogi and uh, disengage from the world. So, uh, so we'll leave it there. Uh, we're almost done with the sixth chapter of Outline of Esoteric Science, and I think uh, there's like 20 more pages to go in this chapter, and then finally we get to chapter six, actually, which is Cosmic and Human Evolution Now and in the Future. That'll be next.